Hi everybody, my name is Alejandra Maiz. I'm an M4 from the University of Illinois Chicago campus. Today we're going to talk about cranial nerve 4 palsies. Briefly in this talk we'll cover the anatomy and neurophysiology of cranial nerve 4, the etiologies of cranial nerve 4 palsies and how an affected patient would present, we'll compare and contrast congenital and acquired palsies where appropriate, next we'll discuss how to examine these patients using a particular test to identify the paretic muscle, we'll perform a sample exam together, and we'll finish by discussing cranial nerve 4 palsy patient management. Cranial nerve 4 is a somatic motor nerve that innervates the superior oblique muscle. This muscle's primary function is in torsion, whereas introduction and abduction of the globe are secondary functions. The function of the superior oblique muscle is best observed when the eye is adducted, as this allows for enhanced introduction of the globe via the superior oblique muscle. It is important to know that cranial nerve 4 has the longest intracranial course of any cranial nerve. It's also the only cranial nerve to exit the brainstem dorsally, decussate, and then curve around ventrally before entering the, the orbit via the superior orbital fissure. The extensive intracranial course of cranial nerve 4 is what makes it much more susceptible to damage in the setting of head trauma in comparison to other cranial nerves. The majority of cranial nerve 4 palsies are congenital. At this point in time, we can't pinpoint exactly what causes these congenital palsies. However, some suspect that they occur secondary to hypoplasia of the nerve's nucleus, birth trauma, anomalous muscle insertion, muscle fibrosis, or structural abnormalities of muscle tendons or the inferior oblique muscle itself. Acquired cranial nerve 4 palsies are less common. However, if they do occur, they are most likely to occur secondary to head trauma, for reasons we discussed in the previous slide. Other causes of acquired cranial nerve 4 palsies include microvascular disease, so patients with hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, or those who smoke tobacco, patients with intracranial hemorrhage or infarction, demyelinating disease, intracranial neoplasms, giant cell arteritis, and finally, there will be some cases for which a cause will be unknown and therefore by definition will be idiopathic. Patients with cranial nerve 4 palsies will complain of double vision while eating, reading, or looking to one side. The second image that they see will be below the original image and rotated slightly, similar to what you see with the smiley faces on the right side of the slide. Some patients may tilt their head away from the affected side to help minimize their diplopia, and the affected eye will be hypertrophic relative to the unaffected eye. Congenital and acquired palsies do present slightly different. Patients with congenital palsies typically learn how to control their diplopia and sometimes won't present until later in life when they lose that control and have sudden onset diplopia. A good way to rule in a congenital palsy would be to ask the patient if they've been told throughout their life that they have a head tilt or if they have numerous pictures of them when they're younger and they're tilting their head. Another thing that can help you is that patients with congenital palsies are notorious for having very large hypertropias in primary gaze, at least 10 prism diopters. Patients with acquired palsies are going to complain of sudden onset diplopia. It's going to be extremely bothersome to them. With these patients, history is extremely important and they will likely need brain imaging. Sometimes if a patient presents with double vision, it can be difficult to figure out exactly which extraocular muscle is causing the problem. The parks bolshowski three-step test is an algorithm that allows the clinician to determine which extraocular muscle is paretic and therefore causing the patient's symptoms. Importantly, this test is unreliable if multiple extraocular muscles are dysfunctional and is most useful for patients with acquired hypertropia secondary to a single muscle palsy. The three steps of this test include identification of the eye that is hypertropic in primary gaze, determining if the hypertropia is worse in left or right gaze, and determining if the hypertropia is greater with left or right head tilt. We'll work through a sample exam together, but the idea is that each step allows you to identify the extraocular muscles that may be involved and when taken together allows you to identify the paretic muscle that is causing the patient's symptoms. Now we'll talk through a sample examination of a patient who presented complaining of vertical and torsional diplopia. Let's put the parks bolshowski test to work. The idea behind each step is to consider which muscles should be functioning to produce the given action and to use each step of the test to rule in or out muscles which may be involved. The affected muscle will be dysfunctional in all three steps of the test. The first step is to determine which eye is hypertropic in primary gaze. If we look at the center of our image, we can see more of the inferior sclera is visible on the right eye than on the left. Therefore, the patient's right eye appears more hypertropic versus the left. This can occur for two reasons. Either a muscle that would normally depress the right eye is non-functional or a muscle that normally elevates the left eye is non-functional. Therefore, the right superior oblique, right inferior rectus, left inferior oblique, or the left superior rectus could be our culprit. 
If we move on to the second step of our exam, we can see that the patient's hypertropia is greater in left gaze. Therefore, our paretic muscle must be one whose primary action is to elevate the left eye, thus the inferior oblique, on the right side, or the left superior rectus, or one whose action is to depress the right eye in left gaze, therefore the right superior oblique, or the left lateral rectus. In step one, we ruled in both the left superior rectus and the right superior oblique as possibly dysfunctional. Therefore, we can eliminate the right inferior rectus and the left lateral rectus from our differential. The final step of our test allows us to decide which of the two final muscles on our differential is non-functional. In a right head tilt, the right superior oblique and the right superior rectus work together to in cyclotort the right eye. When both muscles are functioning, there should be no vertical movement of the right eye. However, if the superior oblique is paretic, then the right superior rectus will act unopposed, causing the right eye to be hypertropic relative to the left, which is what we see in our patient on the bottom left photo. Therefore, the paretic muscle is a superior oblique, and we can rule out the left superior rectus. Before we end with our summary slide, let's briefly discuss how we would manage such a patient with a paretic superior oblique muscle. If you recall, the list of causes for an acquired cranial nerve 4 palsy were numerous, so one could imagine that treating this condition is largely dependent on etiology. If we're able to confirm that the patient's palsy is congenital, then no further workup is indicated. If the palsy is acquired, then we must perform a workup to identify the cause. The first step to identify the etiology of an acquired palsy would be to check the patient's blood pressure and order labs. Fasting blood glucose, hemoglobin A1c, ESR, CRP, and platelets, the first two will help you rule out diabetes, and the last two will help you rule out giant cell arteritis. Neuroimaging is indicated to look for a mass lesion or signs of demyelination disease. A complete neuro exam should also be performed to rule out other neurological symptoms. It's important to know that palsies occurring due to microvascular disease often resolve without treatment in weeks to months after symptom onset. If patients are symptomatic, an eye patch, glasses with prisms, or surgery can be considered. However, surgery is often a last resort and is typically reserved for patients who cannot tolerate prisms or patching. To end our talk, let's review the key points. Cranial nerve 4 innervates the superior oblique muscle, which functions to intort, infraduct, and abduct the globe. Paralysis of this nerve can be congenital or acquired. Patients with cranial nerve 4 palsies will present complaining of vertical and torsional diplopia. They'll often tilt their head away from the affected side to minimize that diplopia, and the affected eye will be hypertropic relative to the unaffected eye. We talked about the parks bolshowski test and how its three steps can be used to identify the non-functional muscle. However, remember that this test isn't very effective if multiple extraocular muscles are involved. Finally, we talked about treatment and how patches, prisms, and surgery can be considered for symptomatic patients. Here's a brief look at my references. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I hope you found this helpful.